Good day. Good day. It's good to be here with you. And as I was about to click the start button there, I was thinking, man, it, it just seems like the weeks are blurring together. There's Sunday, then there's the next Sunday. And at least it feels that way in my world. And I just want to acknowledge, and I, I try to every week, and I'm sure I'm pretty consistent, but I want to acknowledge how grateful I am that you would just take a few minutes even to hear me out, to, to invite me into your homes, into your space, into your, into your lives in this format. Uh, I don't take it for granted. I really don't. I, I pray about it before I even hit the start button. And um, I, I also understand the nature of online uh, videos and, and all this sort of the science behind it. And typically I'm probably breaking all the rules uh, when it comes to quality and sound and all sorts of things that you can do with a video. I, I totally understand that. I do that myself in other formats. But when it comes to, to teaching and preaching the Bible, I, I take it seriously. And for those of you who don't understand that, I'm, I under, I, I'm okay with that. But uh, I really strongly believe that I'm accountable before my God, God, for what I say to you. And, and it's kind of, honestly, a little bit scary. Because I know what the Bible teaches about teachers and preachers, that we are going to be held to a, an account for what we say about God and how we represent Him, how we represent uh, the Bible and how we unpack it and, 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 and understand it. Does that mean I haven't made mistakes? Of course I've made mistakes. I, I'm here not to apologize. I'm here just to tell you how much I appreciate you your patience, your kindness, and even to those of you who don't, don't disagree, you've, I've seen a few of those emojis there, and that's fine. That's fine. I, I have a lot of grace for that, you know, and I hope that, uh, that for those of you who don't agree with what the Bible says or Christianity, and, and even for those who have been hurt by a Christian or what people, uh, who people say are Christians but obviously aren't acting the way the Bible teaches, I... I, uh, I really, truly am sorry for that, and I want you to know that I pray for you, even though I don't even know most of you out there. I pray for you, and the Lord puts you on my heart, and I hope that whatever is going on in your life, that uh, at the very least, uh, there's some sunshine there for you today. But I would ask you to consider God, because He can, he can do things that uh, are impossible for us. So... Having said that, long, long introduction. Uh, let's get right to it. And uh, for those of you who were, w w who, for those of you who were with me or I was with you, however you want to say it, last week, we were addressing the biblical leadership of the local church, as as is found in Paul's letter, his first, uh, his first letter to Timothy. And the Bible teaches that God has ordained and established two primary we'll call leadership offices in the church. There are other leaders in the church. But chapter 3 of uh, 1 Timothy, from chap, uh, verse 1 to 13, uh, gives us those qualifications as they're called. Uh, verse 1 to 7 reveals the qualifications of the office of elder, and verse 8 to 13 reveals the qualifications of the office of deacon. We're also challenged to, to answer the question, what is leadership, or how would we define leadership? Let's keep that in the fore of our mind. Well, well over a decade ago, um, James Coos and Barry Posner, or Posner, I'm not saying that right, I'm sure, co-authored the book, The Leadership Challenge. The authors, leaders in their own, in their own right, compiled what has become a, class, a classic uh, on modern leadership. And their book has become in many ways an essential read for leaders in business and in other areas. Matter of fact, I remember reading that book in my leadership class in seminary. But it's interesting to note that Coos and Posner, Posner uh, present a leadership model that in many ways illustrates the integrity and the character that should model all leaders of Christ's church or in Christ's church. For example, their model of, of leadership would suggest that there are five practices common to what they call personal best leadership experiences. 
One, model the way. Two, inspire a shared vision. Three, change the process. Four, enable others to act. And five, encourage the heart. Now, Pastor John MacArthur, speaking of modeling leadership, or modeling what these authors say best leadership experiences, said, quote, if you want a human model of leadership, I don't think you'll ever find a better model than Paul. Paul is my hero as a leader, MacArthur would say. This is the very one who wrote 1 Timothy that we're, we're going to be working our way through. So if this is true, that the Apostle Paul was a great leader, then it really stands the reason that what Paul said about church leadership, about elders and deacons in the church, we would be wise to pay attention to. At least, at least give it a hearing. And as we take some time today to... Uh, look at the qualifications of, of, of deacons, we must do so with this understanding, this purpose, that what we have in this text, friends, is not simply a list. For if we do that, the danger is that we'll fall into the spirit of comparison. For example, our pastor has nailed one to five, but missed the boat from six to ten. Just put another name in there for pastor or something else. See, no, all of us at one time or another, if we're honest, have missed the boat. And we will do so again. It must be first grace, then consequences follow. And let's not also fall into the other trap that could happen, that is putting our leaders on a pedestal. No, again, it's first grace and accountability follows. Remember, we're, we're, we're talking about leadership in the church. So please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we begin in verse 8 through to 13. 8 through to 13. Chapter 3, verse 8. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. For certain, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and a great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you again uh, for this opportunity to be together in this venue, in this way. We know, Lord, that uh, uh, you are with us by your Spirit, and I pray that you would help each and every one of us to understand, uh, illuminate our minds, Holy Spirit, please, with, with uh, your understanding of this text and its application as well. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first things first, the word deacons we have here in verse 8 is a translation of the original word that means servant or attendant. Now, we could say more about it, but let's keep this within the context of Paul's pastoral letters. That is, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And we will use the word servant to describe the role of a deacon in a church or in the church. Matthew's Gospel, we go there first and we consider chapter 20 where we will find this event described to us by Matthew, the story of the mother of Zebedee's sons, that is James and John, two of Jesus' disciples, going to Jesus and asking him for a favor. And their mother said to Jesus, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. In short, Jesus replied, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. So the answer is not, not, not going to happen. And when the rest of the disciples, uh, the story tells us, got wind of this, uh, they were very irate, very upset with the brothers. And Jesus brought all his disciples together and, re and reminded them of how the world's leaders exercised their leadership. He said that these leaders in the world lord it over them. They exercise authority over them. And then he said, not with you. 
And he said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Very interesting. Then Jesus gave them an example of servant leadership himself. And he said, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. How? To give his life as a ransom for many. We return to the Apostle Paul, and he gives us another example of servant leadership himself. In his letter, he wrote to the Colossian church from prison. He said, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So I wonder if you've noticed very, 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 very soon, we're here at the very beginning, we have in part defined leadership. And it's this. Leadership seeks the well-being of others by serving others first before self. Let me say that again. Leadership seeks the well-being of others by serving others first before self. Now, if we had the time to share, no doubt we would be able to share stories of those we know who had had a servant's heart, who demonstrated this by putting others first in tangible and practical ways. And as we have already heard, we we know of two such people today, Jesus and Paul. They purposefully lived their lives in order to serve others over themselves. And we'll come back to this uh, letter from a different angle. Now, let's take a quick look at the qualifications that deacons should possess. And remember, we are not dealing with a list. We are interested in the integrity and the character and the spiritual maturity of the deacon. So it's always the inside out. Notice the phrase in verse 8 in the same way. What is Paul saying here? Well, he's saying in the same way as elders under demonstrate the characteristics and spiritual uh, maturity required of their office, deacons are to do so as well. So in a paraphr- uh, we'll paraphrase a little bit of these qualifications that we find here in, Timoth- uh, in this letter to Timothy. And we can say a deacon should be what? Serious-minded about spiritual and leadership matters. Seriously-minded about them. The deacon should be known for truthfulness. That, in other words, their yes is their yes, and their no is their no. They're not to be, a, what is it, a lover of wine or a drunkard. Because often with that kind of uh, attitude or that kind of place, space, it often leads to violence. They're not to be greedy or lovers of money. They're not in for the money. Well, those who serve then in this capacity, uh, Paul tells us, must keep hold of really the most important thing, qualification in my mind that sticks out right now is the essential truths of the faith. Truths such as the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the unity of Jesus as God and man, the good news of salvation, the gospel, uh, just to mention a few. One commentator put it this way to this very important qualification. Quote, there's a body of truth to be believed. There is a body of truth to be believed. These servants in the church must hold fast to these truths with conviction and integrity. And not only do these servants hold fast to these truths, they do so with a clear conscience. A conscience that holds nothing against them. Again, the same commentator speaking about this said, quote, intellect and mind must agree with life and purpose. There should not be any incongruencies there. Integrity is so important in any leader, but absolutely important in a church leader. Also, we see, uh, as Paul calls the noble office of deacon, must first be tested, verse 10. See, now Paul was not saying this, that a prospective servant needs to write some sort of exam, study and write an exam, or present a theological paper or treatise. 
What this means is that the potential servant is living a life that is free of anything that could be charged against them that would deny them the opportunity to serve within char with character and integrity and spiritual maturity, such as sincere faith, um, uh, love, and all those things, uh, they should be demonstrated in their lives. And in the same way as elders, it says here in verse 12, where, where a deacon must be faithful to his wife and be able to manage his own children and household as well. Now, there's much to be said about this, and we do not have the time to talk about that. But suffice it to say that if, you, if a person cannot, uh, has no handle on their home life, or there are issues going on in the home life out of, a little bit out of control, they are certainly not going to be able to manage, if you want to use that word, the church. Well, you might have noticed, and I'm sure you have, we, we kind of skimmed right by verse 11, so let's go back there. And for clarity's sake, please notice the word woman. Now, this, this, the original Greek word can be translated woman or wives. And most reliable commentaries uh, when dealing with this present two possibilities. And here they are. Paul is either speaking about wives of deacons or Paul is speaking about women who serve as deacons in the church. So how can we understand this? Which way should we go? And how can we apply it in our, the 21st century context? Frankly, the best way to see this is to understand this as an and or, not one or the other. An and or, not one or the other. You see, women served in the New Testament context back in the first century as deacons in the church. Paul, writing to the Romans in his 16th chapter, said, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Centria. See, men who served as deacons in the church in those days most likely would have also had wives. And this is no different today in the 21st century church. Women serve as deacons in the church and male deacons are married. Either way, it doesn't matter, folks. A woman is held to the same qualification when they serve as a deacon or are married to a deacon. Hopefully you noticed one really significant difference. If you remember the first seven verses, and now here in verse 8 through 13, you will notice, or you should notice, or hopefully you will know now that there's a difference between an elder and a deacon. Elders must be able to teach, verse 2. And along with this spiritual gift of teaching and preaching, the Bible and understanding the Bible and presenting it comes the authority to back it, the Bible itself. Biblically, the office of deacon does not provide for this gift nor the authority to do so. So in a nutshell, the deacon serves under the authority and guidance of the elders of the local church. And last but not least, these servants that we're calling deacons or deacons we're calling servants serve in many different capacities in the church. Whether it's in finance, whether it's in care, hospitality, the maintenance and supervision of the building, the grounds, and, and the list could go on and on. But here's the, the takeaway for us. Elders, the office of elder, elders are the spiritual leaders, teachers, and preachers of the church. And deacons are those who are set aside by the elders to lead by serving the variety of needs that is found in any local congregation. And verse 13 really reminds us that those who serve in this capacity will also grow in their spiritual maturity in many different ways. Well, now we covered that, and we want to go back to what was mentioned earlier. We want to go back to our definition of biblical leadership. And I just want to have one caveat. The character, the integrity, and the motivation of the heart applies to all believers, not only elders and deacons. And honestly, anyone who says, because I do not lead in the church, therefore I'm not to be held in the same standard before God, has in essence really tossed aside the plain teaching 
of the Bible. Seems that anyone who reads the Gospels and the accounts of the early church will sooner or later encounter many examples of servant leaders. We've already mentioned Jesus and Paul. The challenge for all of us when we read their example of servant leadership is this, to pay attention closely to how God defines leadership in comparison to our own understanding, ideas, philosophies, whatever, of leaders and leadership. You know, folks, whether we recognize it or not, all of us have been and continue to be influenced in a variety of ways by the world's definition of a leadership. Remember, dear friends, the Bible teaches that we are primarily dealing with a spiritual reality here. Leadership, however you define it or apply it, secular or in the church, has a spiritual dimension, a spiritual reality to it, either for good and for, or for evil. Author David Mathis said this, quote, from before we can even remember, we have been indoctrinated at nearly every turn with the idea that being a leader means getting the gold star. Leadership is a form of recognition, a kind of accomplishment, the path to privilege. Leadership is a form of success, end quote. And he goes on to say, speaking of our current culture, quote, leadership means privilege, and no generation has considered itself more entitled to privilege than ours. It would be fair to say that this is not only an accurate description of our generation outside the church, and it is also inside the church. But I would suggest to you that this view of leadership has been with humanity since Adam and Eve broke the commandments of God and sin entered the world. So is Mathis being harsh? Am I being harsh? That will be up to you to decide, friends. But the fallout of this has littered our culture and the church with many broken people and abused persons which speak loudly to us from their pain and destroyed faith. The, the attitude that says, I am the king of the hill, has no place... Can I say that again? The attitude that says, I am the king of the hill, has no place in the blood blot church of Jesus Christ. No place in the ministry of elders and deacons. No place in any believer's heart. Mathis is right in his article to say this, quote, Christian leadership is fundamentally about giving, not taking. Christian leaders are not empty, immature individuals looking to prop themselves up with new privilege. Well, this brings us back to that question again. What is leadership? We go back to Jesus. And after Jesus washed his disciples' feet on the last Passover meal that they would share together, he said to them, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. We also remember what we heard earlier that what Jesus said to the disciples who were bickering between the two, but because of the two who wanted to seek a higher position for themselves. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The Apostle Peter, who stood out as a leader of the rest of the apostles, said to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those who entrusted to you, but being examples to the flocks. Oh Lord, may we be examples. Brothers and sisters, do you want a biblical definition of leadership? One that models God's desire for every one of his people. Every one of his people. And here it is. Leadership is serving others before self and is a willingness to sacrifice for others. Let me say it again. Leadership is serving others before self and it is a willingness to sacrifice for others. Mathis puts it this way. 
Quote, Christian leadership in the home, the church, and elsewhere is not for those clawing for honor and recognition, but for those most ready to fall to their knees and to be inconvenienced by the needs of others. End quote. Friends, of all the places on this earth, the church should be where service and sacrifice are the very lifeblood, the very lifeblood of every believer in Jesus Christ. Because, friends, for God did not spare even his own son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I can be forgiven of our sins and receive the hope of eternal life. My challenge to each and every one of you who call yourself Christian is to ask yourself these questions. Am I a giver or a taker? Do I consider myself better than others? Do I look down at my brothers and sisters in the Lord? Is the desire of my heart to serve others? Would I be willing to give up my comfort, my money, my time, my energy, even my life if needs be, and sacrifice it for some other? Friends, the answers you come up with, I leave with you and God. Father, thank you. This is a challenge. This is a mighty, mighty challenge in our culture. A culture of priority over sacrifice. A culture steeped, steeped in stars, gold stars, where there's nothing bad about any person where there's nothing good about any person that says there's nothing bad, that says that something's bad. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that I hope and I pray that you understand what I'm praying. Lord, help us in the church, your church, to be models of sacrifice, models of servants, like Peter, like Paul, like Jesus, like all the saints that have gone before us, those that we don't even know of, who have even given their lives for some others. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me. God bless you. Shalom.